Hello everyone, and welcome to the second playtest of Mermaids After the End. We are using the 1.7k rule set. So if you're seeing this on YouTube, it's entirely possible that we have already a new edition of the rules out. Uh, but as this is a playtest, I do expect there to be uh, things that need clarification in the rules. I'm expecting there to be uh, a little bit of, hey, how do I do X? How do I do Y? So just bear with us as we kind of go through this system, because it's a learning experience not only as me as the GM about what needs clarification, but it's also for my players, you know, them getting to learn the system. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and jump right into things. So to start things off, if you will imagine the Earth, and the Earth is about 70% water by default, not so much in the world of Mate. Uh, in the world of Mate, a catastrophe or a catastrophe has happened. Uh, not only has global warming raised the sea level that way, but as part of the apocalyptic process, a giant ball of ice, a comet, has slammed into the Earth and killed almost, I, I don't want to say 90% of the population, but a very good chunk of it. In the process of this comet hitting, the sea levels have risen to levels that mean that the existing land or what is left over is what used to be mountain ranges and it is one specific mountain range that we turn our attention to for this session now all of you have received a message from lord mar mar is a very prominent land dweller known for his almost zealous quest to re to acquire pre-apocalypse art now, as an aside here, uh, all of you know that a land dweller is the colloquial term for a sort of noble born or a, a high born that literally lives on the premium land that remains. So very, very hoity toity, very important kind of person. And you know that you're not actually meeting with Lord Mar himself. You are meeting with a retainer and that retainer's name is Zervos. Zervos is, well, you actually don't know a whole lot about him. You just know that he is your point of contact. And specifically, uh, you are to meet him at a dwelling near Mont Blanc, one of the seven, one of the major land masses that remains. And specifically, this dwelling is one that, rely, or one that lies just below the surface of the ways, a quote-unquote tube-man dwelling. And this sort of dwelling, if you will imagine Sea Lab 2020, uh, any sort of uh, underwater base, uh, it is, or maybe even a Bioshock would be a good descriptor. Um, imagine sort of lots of transparent windows, a lot of tubes that afford uh, both water and air access, a lot of pools that you can swim up into. Uh, basically, it's an underwater utopia type setting. And you know that Zervos is to meet you in a very specific part of this dwelling. And this dwelling is important because it is not the public dwelling, like a public meeting place. This is a very important sort of VIP space. So Zervos, or probably his extension Lord Mar, uh, is spending quite a little, little bit of money on getting you all into this meeting. But uh, as you all come up into the pool, which leads up into an air-filled environment, uh, I'd like us to go around and just briefly introduce our characters. So why don't we start with uh, Tiger? Why don't we just introduce your character real quick? Uh, my uh, character's name is Alton. He is basically, he's a hunter. He's like a, kind of a merc. Uh, he goes where there is like where, where there's loot and and money. Um, at a young age, he's he's gotten a lot of scrapes or scraps, and that's how he uh, developed his skill with with uh, his his knives um, or other blade uh, edged weapons or even like blunt weapons, uh, what what have you in this setting. Um, but he's he's pretty he's he's not afraid to mix it up. Uh, but because he's kind of a loner, his, his people skills need a little work. Um, that's about it. Okay. And you're running the Nareed frame, correct? Yes. Okay. Alice, what do you got going on? 
Uh, so my character is Lillian. She was raised in an orphanage and basically uh, as she grew up she ended up having to sort of become the sort of big sister figure to everyone there um, and ended up going out and starting to take on jobs in order to earn some extra money to support the orphanage. Um, eventually picking up quite a few skills particularly related to assassination uh, such as sneaking and stabbing although despite all this she ch still tries to have a very cheery and upbeat disposition okay and what frame are you running uh, i am running the kraken frame excellent and then last but not least uh mr shizno what are you running uh in terms of appearance, uh, because of the whole transhuman cyborg changeover, he doesn't really keep a human look. Uh, he's a little bit augmented. He doesn't really care, so his social skills kind of take a hit for that. Um, but he's a hunter. He's uh, He hails from Kilimanjaro. Okay. Uh, but he got out of there quickly because he just wanted to you know, explore. Um, he likes technology more than he likes people. But he does uh, protect them with his big old cancer crab frame. All righty. So the three of you, you have all arrived at this pool together. And as you come together, uh, you realize that you are the first ones here. Your contact has not arrived just yet. Now, this space, as I said, is a pool that you would swim up into. And then above the pool is an open aired, pressurized environment. And it's very opulent. There's all manner of uh, art on display on the walls. Uh, you can see that there are fine sculptures, uh, bits of jewelry, and other batters on display. Again, it's a VIP space, and it definitely looks like they have paid a premium to have you meet here. But I think this is an excellent opportunity for you all to say hello to one another. How's it going? Um. Uh, hi, it's nice to meet you. My name is Lillian, and she sticks out her hand to shake the hand of whichever of the two is nearest. Alton will grab, uh, will, will shake Lillian's hand with both hands, kind of enthusiastically. It's a pleasure to meet you. And he's kind of being like force, forcefully awkward. Uh, yeah, hi, folks. So, is the big boss man not here yet? I haven't seen him. Mm. You know how these types are. Fashion will be late. Oh, well. They're always on time in their point of reference because they're never late. Ah, but God forbid we're even one second later than they expect us to. <laughs> Yeah. It is what it is. Can't do much about it. And almost as if speaking of the devil, uh, you see coming uh, down a corridor, and uh, the corridor sort of is open to the space you're in. Uh, coming down a corridor is a gentleman in full humanoid form, which means he is currently in either a land dwelling body or is in a cyborg frame that is not really meant to be in the water. In any event, uh, this gentleman is very appropriately dressed. He has a, uh, a suit on, a three-piece suit, a uh, very prominent tie that he's adjusting as he walks up to you all and says, Well, now, I was uh, a bit delayed getting here, but I'm glad to see that you all arrived. So uh, tell me, uh, are you here for the job for Lord Mar? We sure are. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'm here to tell you the specifics of the job. Uh, more specifically, we have, uh, shall we say, eyes on what could be a, a bit of pre-melting art, which I don't think I need to tell you is something that Lord Ma is very much enthusiastic about acquiring. I'm sure we can handle that just fine. I thought yep. as much. I would not have contacted you otherwise. So are the deets. Well, uh, I'm sending you the coordinates now. And without any physical gesture, um, via the CNET, the internet that is global and connects everyone on the planet, 
um, you all receive uh, almost like a little chime in your head along with a set of coordinates. And you know immediately that these coordinates are approximately three kilometers down into the water. So you are going to risk losing connection with CNET, but this is not something surprising, especially for pre-melting art. Um, you kind of have to go deep in order to get the good stuff. Uh, but after the coordinates are sent, uh, Zervos continues and says, Now, I've been uh, offered a uh, discretionary fund to cover any of your expenses and anything as a reward. And uh, he lists off a sum that it is enough that you could afford to, quote unquote, upgrade your licenses and more or less eat like kings for a week. That sounds good. So what's the catch? Are there any dangers or any threats? Well, that's part of the catch is, uh, let's just say you aren't the first team I've hired for such a thing. In fact, I've sort of hedged my bets and I've hired three, including yourselves. Are they looking at the same time as us or have they gone before and not returned? They the left depths? approximately uh, 30 minutes ago. Oh, so they've got a head start. Should make it a little bit fairer then. Ah, I like your moxie. Now it's worth saying that uh, whichever one of the teams or whoever really comes back with the art in hand, they're going to get paid. The rest, not so much. So if someone were to go, uh, I don't know, missing, it's fine? As far as I'm concerned, as long as I get the art, whatever happens, happens. Good. I mean, oh, I hope that doesn't happen to any one of the other teams. And Zervos just sort of smiles at that. Now, is there anything else we should know? Well, it depends on what you're asking. Will there be any surprises when we try to retrieve the piece of art? And I think this is a good opportunity to do our first roll. So the way rolling works in Mate is you assemble a pool of D12s that is relevant to an attribute, and then you roll it against a skill uh, which has its own number. So, for example, uh, Tiger, uh, you are going to be rolling a Charisma and a either a Persuasion or an Intimidation. So what is your uh, Charisma score? A three. A three? So you would be rolling 3d12. And what is uh, your skill roll? Intimidation. Or three. Three? Sorry. So you'll be rolling 3d12, and we're looking for anything below a three. Now, what I've done in roll 20 is there should be a global macro available to everyone. And if you click the mate roller macro, it should walk you through everything you need to do as part of the rolling. Uh, where's that? Uh, if you go to the Collections tab, uh, which is the bulleted list on the right-hand menu in Roll20. So if we just create a Roll20 session or join a random one, then we'll have access to it? Uh, it needs to be the one-shot one specifically. So mm. it's attribute value three. Or no. Yeah, three. Yep. Oh, okay. Now, no. this is interesting no. because okay. of, well, there's a thing called uh, messy critical. Now, the way. No. <laughs> so, the way uh, criticals work so, if you roll two ones, you achieve what is known as a full critical, a critical success. And that means that not only do you succeed, but you get a positive effect. You need to roll at least two ones for that. You've rolled two 12s, and the way two 12s work is you still succeed, but a complication occurs. Some, something negative happens. And had you not succeeded at all, had you not gotten at least the one success, um, what would have happened is you would have achieved what is known as a complication. Uh, and that means that not only do you not succeed, but a negative thing happens as well. So for the messy critical... You have a few options. You can either just take the, the negative effect, which I will describe, 
or you can give me meta currency known as risk. And this meta currency is something I can spend to mess with your roles and your tasks. So which would you like to do? Would you like to keep the complication or would you like to give me meta currency? What would be more interesting? I would say both would be interesting because I have many uses for risk. Well, let's do the, the meta, uh, meta currency. Okay, so I will take two points of risk. And just as sort of an aside, as GM, I start with two points of risk for every player. So I was at six. I am now at eight. So uh, you're you... welcome. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I said you're welcome, everyone. <laughs> So uh, what happens is, you know, you ask Zervos for some more information and he thinks about it for moments and says, well, from what I know, the coordinates are for a long lost, a long thought lost museum. Uh, I think it has some sort of a state art security, but uh, it's kind of why we're sending hunters is uh, y'all are good at getting into those sorts of things. Good. Is there anything else, guys? Uh, no, nope, I think it should be everything. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, uh, do we know the team's call signs or, I don't know, any identification markings we can keep an eye out for? Yeah, uh, he says, uh, well, the first team, uh, I didn't really get their names, but I know they were all using the Mersharks. They were uh, demolition experts. Lots of explodey stuff. Uh, second team... Uh, they were the Cilia, Cilia boys. Uh, they were using uh, a lot of ancient tech. They had a lot of gadgetry with them. I didn't really care to know. Interesting. Okay. Well, unless yeah. there's anything else, get to it. Okay, let's go, Vaughn. All right. So, the act of getting from where you are leaving the tube mad dwelling and diving deeper and deeper into the ocean um we have to deal with two things the first is if you all want to race ahead and try to beat the other teams uh, there would be a task involved um i would tell you it is a difficulty of four now i did not mention this previously and i'll take the opportunity to do so now in Mate, there is a sliding difficulty scale. And what that means is you have to have that many number of successes to pass the task. So for this, the athletics task that would be involved in beating the other two teams to your destination, uh, that would be a difficulty of four, which means you would have to roll four successes. Is that each or between us? Uh, that would be among all of you. And you can decide if one of you is assisting the other. Now, assisting is very simple. Uh, you simply nominate that up to one other person is assisting you. And they, are, they roll the same thing as you, just one dice, though. So for this instance, uh, I would say that this would probably be either a strength or a body plus your athletics. And again, it is a difficulty of four. Okay, well, if, if anything, I'll probably assist on that because my athletics is only one. Okay. Strength and body are both eight, and my athletics is a four. Okay, but, yeah, you should definitely try that then. Okay. <laughs> and I'll, I'll assist with one dice. So I basically have to get a one or... Right? Well, what, what, uh, what is uh, Tiger? What do you got going on? My strength is a five, body of four, and athletics three. There you go. So I am just rolling the body or strength? Yep, and whichever one you roll is the same one that uh, Tiger will be rolling. All right. Uh, Tiger, what was your highest up between body and strength? Strength at five. Okay. Okay, here we go. Uh, doesn't that not really matter when it comes to assisting, since no matter what the body or strength value, Tiger would just be rolling one dice? Yeah, he will be rolling the one die. Uh, so, Tiger, let's see uh, one dice from you underneath your athletics. Uh, so that looks like three successes. 
Oh, you know what? I'm just now realizing that put, the sign is than, incorrect. Not less than. <laughs> yep, let me fix that real quick. Well, I guess should be less than or equal to. Yeah, so let's see. So I don't think it actually rolled anything, Tiger. Yeah, it only it didn't roll any dice. Mm. Uh, but looking at uh, Shizno's rolls, I see a two, a one, and a two. So that's three successes. So for my attribute, I, I, pick, I put zero, right? Uh, you would put one. So you're rolling one okay. die. Uh, and then skill value three. Correct. Or, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so what this means is you have only achieved three successes. <clears throat> and this brings up, coincidentally, another mechanic. Um, in Mate, because it is a narrative-based system, I encourage GMs to let their players fall forward, which basically means that they may not totally succeed, but that they still are able to proceed, like they're not gated behind failure. So in this instance, uh, you have two options before you, and I'm going to let you as a group decide. You can either uh, arrive before the other teams, but I will take some more meta currency, or you simply will get there more or less at the same time as the second team. What do we want? Do we want to get in and out before they can get there, or do we want to... Well, if we arrive first, we get a head start, and we can start looking and securing the, the painting or art. But if we arrive second, we can let the we can let the we can let someone do the work for us and just take it from them. Yeah. So I'm fine follow, with either. Follow the follow them in and let them in, run into any traps or nasties that might be in there. Yes. Okay. So yeah. Uh, with this plan, uh, one thing I'd also like to address is how are you all communicating? Now, because you're underwater, uh, there's a little bit difference between communicating uh, over air. So sound carries very well in water. So you can, like if you were to speak underwater, you can hear that at a very great distance. Uh, which means that if you're trying to have a private conversation, you probably want to, you know, keep that over a transmission. And the limit on your transmission uh, at your level, at least for the beginning adventure, um, you are limited to about uh, 15 to 20 meters. After that, it gets really spotty. Um, but as long as you are within 15 to 20 meters of one another, you can communicate almost telepathically with one another. Okay. Well, um, uh, since my... Uh, since my athletics is low, my character's going to be pretty close because she's basically just going to be sitting on the back of um, the cancer frame, just basically hitching a ride. Okay. That's how I imagine the other two were actually. I just like just grabbed them like, and just went into the water. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe with uh, Tiger's character, uh, Atlan, just every once in a while, like steering you via the head or via the claws, just like every once in a while just shifting you in the right direction yeah <laughs> okay. i tend to i tend to bulldoze through things he's like no 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 we <laughs> we need to live too <laughs> i love it all right so as you descend into the water uh you pass through the twilight zone the area of the underwater uh, the area of the underwater, that's where it's the area of the ocean that sunlight barely gets to and after about a uh, kilometer down or a kilometer down, um, the light sort of stops and you have to turn on your gears running lights and your frames running lights just to see where you're going. And it's almost desolate. It's like going through the jet darkness or the jet black of space um, where as far as you are concerned, all around you is darkness. Uh, you're obviously able to see one another because you're in such close proximity but you're not able to see the surface. You're not able to see any landmarks. Uh, all you're really going on is your instrument readings that feed whether or not you are headed towards the right coordinates. Uh, it's a very unnerving experience. And for this, I would like everyone to roll me a, let's call this a charisma and a persuasion. 
And the difficulty on this is just a one, so you only need the one success. Uh, wait, that didn't. Okay, so Alice, what? it looks like you... It didn't roll properly. It didn't roll properly, what? Roll 4d12. That should have worked. There we go. I just do it that way. All right, uh, uh, three sorry. successes. So Alice, you're fine. Uh... Uh, you are having uh, zero issue with the oppressing darkness. Lillian is cu a cool cucumber, as it were. <laughs> um, as far as Kairos and Atlan are concerned, though, I mean, you've been on dives before. You've been on deeper dives than this. But maybe the darkness is starting to get to you. Uh, maybe it's just a little too unnerving to literally be in nothingness. Um, and what I'm going to say is that until you are able to see the bottom of the ocean floor, or at least some form of landmark, uh, all of you, well, not all of you, uh, Atlan and Kairos are going to suffer the complication, and that complication is that you are uh, unnerved, you are disturbed, you're nervous, you're anxious, uh, however you want to flavor it, but you are narratively, you are, again, unnerved. Mm. Didn't uh, one of them get one success, though? And wasn't it a difficulty one? You're correct. I can read my own numbers. So let me <laughs> take that back. <laughs> Atlan is fine. Kairos is the one that's unnerved. Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> so you continue down and down and further down into the depths and eventually you get that little ping in the back of your mind that tells you that you are leaving the area of CNET. Now I've touched about CNET before and it's worth noting here that as long as you're connected to CNET, you are on the global internet, meaning you can talk to anyone anywhere on the globe. Uh, CNET only goes down but so far into the ocean though. And past that, you are more or less cut off from the internet. And this is important for several reasons. The first is that if you're trying to get research data, you're trying to uh, more or less call upon the resources of the internet, uh, you can't do that if you don't have CNET. But probably the most important one for all of you is that if the worst happens, if you're injured or for some reason you your cyborg frame is destroyed, you could actually die here. Whereas if you were connected to CNET and your body dies, quote unquote, then you more or less move your consciousness from that dying body into CNET. So you are more or less being confined into your shells. To make a ghost in the shell joke, you are literally a ghost in the shell right now. Um, and again, this isn't the first time it's happened. You've dealt with this before. I'm not going to have you roll for it. But again, it's it's just a slightly unnerving experience to be, you know, suddenly have that weight of the internet behind you, and then it's just nothing. It's just silence. Uh, but the good news is after about another 10, 15 minutes of descending, you begin to see the remnants of a sunken city. Uh, the ruins are old enough that only the buildings that were built of the strongest materials have sort of maintained their form. So you're seeing perhaps the remnants of what could have been a hotel, uh, maybe a bank of some sorts, and other sorts of uh, columns and bits of ruin here and there on the ocean floor. Um, but because you opted to arrive second, what you notice as you approach the bottom of the floor is that there are other lights already among the ruins. Now, if you want to see from this, this distance what those lights are, you can roll for it, or you can just simply descend further. It's entirely up to you. I mean, I'll try to look. I don't know how success successful I'll be. <clears throat> yeah, I'll try to. Okay. Uh, what I would say is this would be a uh, intelligence and a perception. And anyone who wants to roll can certainly roll. All right, so one success for Atlan. 
Zero successes for Lillian. And two successes for Kairos. So, uh, Altan, or Atlan, I'll say it right eventually. Uh, Tiger, uh, your character does note that the lights appear to be of a Mershark. Like, you can recognize the pattern of lights. These are coming from Mershark frames. So this is probably the Mershark team, the demolition experts. Kairos, with two successes, what you're seeing is that there's actually a second set of lights. And the second set of lights is coming from a spot away from the ruins, but at a distance that you can't really discern what they might be coming from. Like, what's the pattern of the lights? You can't really discern what they're coming from. Um, but it's probably a safe guess that the cilia team, that could be them. Or it could be some form of uh, bioluminescent life. You're not sure. Okay. I'll point them out, uh, just everyone. It's like, okay, we got lights here and lights there. Pretty sure those are the Mersharks, and those ones, I don't know. But um, we can do a couple of things. We can avoid them, wait for them to go in. Or, well, send them back up. Hopefully, maybe, in one piece. Do you have any thoughts? I could always try and slip in and try to get a closer look at them. And then signal you with my lights when I can have a better idea of what's what down there. And if you can sneak in, that's good. Mm -hmm. I can't sneak. That big. I'm not the best either at that. But, um. Don't worry, I've got a knack for slipping into places I want to be. How will you signal us? Um, I'll use my lights. I'll flash once for it's safe to come down, or twice if I'm gonna come back up there. I'll Three if you need help? Yeah. Sounds like a plan. That it does. Okay. So is stealth, dexterity, and stealth? You got it. Okay, so seven dice needing a four less. Now, as uh, as she is rolling... Oh, God. <laughs> oh, dear. All right, so I was going to oh, roll, no. but... This is, uh, this is interesting, because as I mentioned earlier, if you roll two 12s and you don't succeed, you basically score what is a complication. <laughs> and I think instead of offering you the ability to give me meta currency, I'm going to just go ahead and introduce the complication. Yeah. <laughs> and the complication is, uh, as Lillian, as you descend and maybe turn off your running lights... You know, make it so that you blend in with the darkness around you. As you get about halfway between your team and where the Mershark team is, uh, what happens is all of a sudden your lights of your cyborg frame go full spotlight mode. As in, you are a shining beacon to everyone. And those of you that didn't go with her, uh, you see that the Mershark lights all kind of stop, look up at her direction... And the second set of lights, they just sort of remain where they are. But the Mershark team has probably definitely noticed uh, Lillian, unfortunately. I just look to Altown and go like, is that one flash? Uh, maybe. Should we try to hide and see what happens? Or do we want to go to her? Uh, if I try to hide, I'm just going to cause a scene. I have um, no luck with hiding. Uh, I'm, so are they, are they just looking at Lillian, or are they coming towards her? Uh, after a few moments, one of them does begin approaching you. One begins to swim up towards your direction. Okay. Um, Lillian is going to plaster a big happy smile on her face. Hi there. Um, assuming you're the one of the other teams that were sent down here to by... Uh, Zivos. So the Mersharks swims up to you, uh, keeps a respectable distance, and replies in audio form so everybody in the immediate area can hear it more or less. Um, and this individual says, "Yeah, we were we were hired by uh, the Zervos feller. 
Uh, did he uh, hire you too? Are you our backup? Uh, I wouldn't really say backup, but I don't want to. I have no intention of trying to ruffle any feathers or, in this case, any fins. Um, we are both hired for this job, but I want to treat this fairly, so I thought I'd put my lights on full blast so that you'd have plenty of notice I was on the way so that I wouldn't be catching you guys by surprise or anything and we could just announce that hey we're here to look for it too but we'll try to give each other a wide berth so that and whoever finds it first no hard feelings i think that would be an excellent persuasion role uh <laughs> so this is going to be a charisma and a persuasion okay so four and three And this is actually a good time for me to do an opposing roll. Well, uh, with zero successes, unfortunately, I'll still roll because it's a good uh, opportunity to s show what happens in an opposed roll. So an opposed roll is pretty much what it says. Uh, it is an opposed roll, and whoever has the most successes uh, is considered to be the victor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so they're going to go ahead and roll. Uh, they're rolling underneath the four. Yeah, so they get one success on you. And let's just say that maybe when you say the words, no hard feelings, um, the Mershark mercenary in front of you sort of grimaces a little bit. The features of his face get a little bit more steely. And he says, yeah, how about you just go back to whatever team you came with and we'll pretend we didn't see you. Okay, um, and she turns around and swims off back to the others, Deactiv deactivating a light, uh, lights down to a normal level as she goes. Okay. So you arrive back with the others. So... So that didn't go well. Ah. You're still yeah. alive, right? That's that's a plus. That is a plus. Um, what they meaning, say? Um, basically... Uh, I, I told them that I wanted to, that we wanted to give them a wide berth. I'm not entirely sure if they believe me, um, but we should, pr at the very least, we should try and check places they're not because antagonizing them any more at this point is probably a bad idea, unless we, unless we want to fight our way through them. Now the. Did you mention that there was a second source of lights? Did, did that react? No, the uh, second set of lights is uh, just remaining where it is, just sort of floating ominously off into the darkness. Well, if worse comes to worse, maybe we can check that out. And if it's some sort of apex predator, we can lure it back to the site to scare off everyone. Mm, that could definitely work. Just a thought, but that's that's like a doomsday uh, option. <laughs> let's let's not antagonize the the wildlife if it is indeed, you know, mean. Mm. Well, I think it's time we go inside then. Agreed. Yep. Okay. So what this is going to involve is whichever one of you has the highest tracking. This is going to be a intelligence and a tracking. Uh, this will be a difficulty of three. So I have three tracking. Oh, okay. Good. But I have three intelligence. I have four intelligence, two tracking. I have two intelligence and one tracking. So what I would say is that one person can assist on this. I'll assist... Uh... Uh, else. Hmm? No, you. I should definitely not be any part of this. Oh. <laughs> I have two intelligence and one tracking. Crowley. Sorry. Alright. Okay, so I oh. see one success already. And what do I roll? Uh, you are rolling one die underneath your tracking. Uh, 
two successes. So we're going to again fall forward here. I'm going to take some more risk for this. Eventually, you know, avoiding the other Mershark uh, team, you begin to comb through the ruins looking for any signs that might be something that houses art still. And at first, it, you know, it, it goes slowly. Uh, you're not really sure what you're looking at. Like, you begin coming through a hotel only to realize that it was actually an apartment building. You know, things that wouldn't normally hold the art. And what this means is about an hour passes. And it is at this point that we need to handle another mechanic and something that is uh, very important for any dive. Now, in a uh, mate's system... Approximately every hour, 30 minutes, whatever is appropriate the GM feels, uh, there is what is known as a uh, pressure roll. And this pressure roll is meant to be sort of a motivator so that the players can't just, you know, oh, I am going to take 20 or I'm going to, uh, you know, just go very slowly taking my time. The pressure is meant to be sort of that ramping difficulty that makes it so that the players have to act now or risk losing whatever kind of a thing. Um, so in this instance, we're going to do it, quote unquote, by the book. Um, 30 minutes have passed. So what's going to happen is all of you are going to roll a single D12. And this is going to be against your body attribute. I believe that. If it's equal to or lower, then that's a pass for me with a body of six. Okay, so you pass just fine. So, body of eight. So I'm rolling. Just a D12, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's lower or higher? L uh, lower, and it is uh, less than or equal to. Okay. So I rolled a three, body of four. All right, you're fine. All right, you're all fine. Your cyborg frames are easily handling the gas exchange issues. The pressure isn't really what kills you down here. It's the uh, the gas exchange, or at least so my research suggests. But uh, what matters is after about an hour of searching, uh, I'm going to spend risk, because it's a good time to do so, to create a situation. And what this means is that something happens, and that something is that there is the sound of an explosion. Uh, so explosions underwater, they're very deadly um, because water compresses uh, very easily and the pressure can literally kill you even if you're not in the explosion itself. So almost a shockwave of a depth charge passes over all of you. You're fine, but you definitely know that the Mershark have set off some sort of an explosion uh, approximately about three blocks that way kind of a thing. Um, but what was really important is that as the shockwave ripples outward, remember those luminescent lights that I mentioned earlier that were hiding off in the darkness? They begin to approach, and as they approach, you realize that it's not the Cilia team. They are a bunch of bioluminescent giant squid, and they are descending on both you and the other team. Now, you have the opportunity to hide or confront them, it's entirely up to you how you proceed from here. Hide. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, you know what? We'll try. We'll, we'll try and hide. Okay. Um. Or, or, or at the very least, it might be idea for, uh, since I'm probably the, uh, well, uh, the narrator is probably the squishiest, uh, with body of, uh, four, but I'm not too far behind in terms of squishiness, um. At the very least, I'm going to try and hide so that um, if the cancer draws the attention of the squids, then I can try and jump them when they're not expecting it. Okay. So, Should we try to swim towards the explosion? Maybe the more sharks will be there and we can go take, two, take care of two birds with one stone. We can try that. Option. We can also oh. just, if we do hide, we can have the octopuses just deal with the mersharks, and then hopefully mm -hmm. they just leave. Yeah. So the so it's uh, dex and stealth, right? 
Yep, it would be a dexterity and a stealth. Though I will say there is an argument for it being a body uh, stealth as well. Okay, I'll take the body over the stealth. All right, uh, so does dex. anyone have a stealth of one? Let's ask that question. Uh, me. <laughs> okay. So again, it's a opportunity to uh, bring up mechanics. So if you have a one in a in a skill, uh, what that means is you are currently untrained or unskilled, and what that means is instead of crit fishing, where you would roll um, a bunch of die just to try and get that one, you would instead roll a single d12 underneath the relevant attribute. So for example. Uh, because you're using body stealth, you would roll 1d12 underneath your body. Okay. And again, this is to prevent crit fishing or just getting a bunch of die and just hoping for crits. Well, let's, uh, let's see what happens here. Hey, five, six, or five is definitely a success. So... Uh, what I'm going to managed to do, and I actually managed to do what my character's built for and vanish into the shadows this time. Yep. Yeah. So what I would say is that working together as a team, as you should be, uh, you manage to hide away in the remnants of what was the apartment building. Maybe you actually go further into the building so that you don't have line of sight. And you wait maybe about two, three minutes, and then another five. And you're starting to wonder, hey, should we go check? Is the scene clear? When you all hear the muffled thumps of what is probably a, a tube, a, a bolt tube. Um, kind of a bit of lore here. A bolt tube is more or less a torpedo launcher. Um, and it's probably not that hard to surmise that the mer sharks are dealing with the wildlife. Okay. Uh, what should we do? Should we give it a bit more time? Or should we try and move in a bit closer and uh, get a better view of what's happening? Well, I can stay here while the sneakiest of us can go and check it out. Yeah, we could do that. Or, I mean, pressure's building, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, we may need to we may need to hurry it up. True. How about this? How about we just go uh, and just keep looking? Like we're we didn't get the attention to the octopus. They're dealing with it right now, so we could just keep looking. Though at the same time, the the fact that they used a debt debt charge and um, something it could potentially uh, reveal their location to a lot of wildlife and other creatures that might be about. Yeah. Um, probably means they found something. They 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 found something that has them confident enough to set off something like a debt charge. Or they're horribly losing, and they were getting panicked and shot off a torpedo. They're more sharks after all. So come on. <laughs> What do you say about mer sharks? They fire their torpedoes quickly, and then they're sad afterwards. Are they tired too? Well, hey, that, that's your statement. <laughs> and because we haven't touched on this yet, I'm going to give you a point of drive uh, for that little bit of uh, pun uh, intended. <laughs> so. Uh, what Drive is, is it is a meta currency that the players have. And you all can spend Drive in a myriad of ways. Um, but basically, it's meta currency that you can use to affect your roles or the narration that's going on. Um, so you have one point of Drive right now. You can hold up to six. Okay. Um, well, I think for now, I will attempt to sneak closer to try and see what the situation is um just just this time no flashing lights no um, long burst of lights okay well that's two successes so <laughs> better right. than zero 
definitely better than zero. Uh, let's go ahead and see how the other team is faring. They've only scored one success. So Lillian, you steal out of the apartment, head towards the direction of where the depth charge went off. And as you sort of uh, peek around a corner, uh, what you see is the now dead form of the giant squid, uh, the bioluminescence slowly dimming and becoming uh, one with the darkness around it. Uh, but what you're seeing is that the mersharks, uh, one of them appears to be badly injured. They are sporting a long gash along their left arm. And the there is another two which look perfectly fine. And then the fourth one uh, is a little bit nervous and is currently in conversation uh, using audio, which means you can hear it. And what they say is, look, we tried blowing the door. We don't have anything that's going to get through it. Maybe we should just call it on this one. If we can't get in, those other teams aren't going to get in either. And uh, one of the others says, look, man, I just got it. I just look. Do you know what's going to cost to reprint this? And uh, the first voice says, all right, look, do you have any bright ideas then? Because I don't know how to get through this door. And uh, what I would call at this point is uh, if Lillian can give me a intelligence and a perception, please. Okay, well, on the upside, I've got uh, four in perception, but I've only got two intelligence, so we'll see how well this goes. Nope. Okay. It's all you see. It's all you see in here. Okay. Uh, she'll make her way back to where the others are. Do I need another stealth check for that? Or is she fine to just head back without... You're fine to head body? back. Okay. Uh, so it looks like they're trying to get through some sort of door. Uh, I was pretty much right on the money in that they found something which necessitated the use of a depth charge. Though so far it doesn't sound like they're having much luck. Um... Uh, it seemed like they were close to giving up, but some of them seemed pretty determined to keep going. There's three of them there that seem in pretty good fighting shape, and one that was pr seemed pretty heavily wounded from the fight with the giant squids. Is there another giant squid we can lure to them? <laughs> I'd be worried about accidentally luring it to us mm. if we tried. Well, we could make an offer that we split the reward. If Do you think money. they would accept that after they spurned us? Well, they spurned her. They didn't see us. So, and they have an injured friend. So, maybe we can take advantage of that. Are uh, either of you very skilled in first aid by any chance? Maybe you could offer to help patch them up? <laughs> I'm an amateur. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, so none of us can first aid. Probably something we should look into next time we come down here. Fair. Well, um, it, it, where, what were they using the depth charge on? Uh, I didn't get a good look at it, but if it's something the debt charge couldn't get through, I would assume some kind of vault. Do you think there's another way in, or do we need those charges? Um, I mean, their depth charges uh, didn't, from what they sound, from what it sounded like, it didn't sound like the depth charges were doing a whole lot. So I don't think going. Uh, and trying to take the depth charges will do much. Uh, but at the same time, generally there's only one way into a vault, so we'll probably have to go through them rather than around them if we want to get in there. Well, we can always talk and see what happens. Hmm. And if they don't like uh, what we have to say, we can always introduce them to uh, Mr. Pinchy. Just hold up his claw and pinch a couple times in the air. 
Uh, Lillian grins as um, a couple of her tentacles reach up into the back of her clothes and come out with knives in them. Look at you and all your fancy appendages. <laughs> and then uh, Alton just wave, like, wiggles his fingers. I have a question for you. Will it blend? No. <laughs> Well, let's go deal with these more sharks either peacefully in three words yeah, or other means. Hopefully Are they're you... open to reason. Just because I'm good at killing doesn't mean I like to. Are you giving us a ride or are you going to make us similar ourselves? Oh, do you want another ride under my back? <laughs> that was kind of fun. Okay, hop up. Oh, th <laughs> thank you. <laughs> nice. So um, I think Lillian's going to hang back a little bit, um, just so that because uh, with the the way they reacted to her before, she probably thinks that um, her being with the other two might be um, a bit of a detriment to trying to reason with them. Possibly. Good thinking. So she's going to hang back out of sight and just keep her ear out. Okay. So, uh, Kairos and Alton, you proceed f as a group uh, towards the location with the Mersharks with uh, Lillian hanging back. And eventually, you sort of round that corner she was hiding behind originally, and you are presented with the four Mersharks. And the four of them stop sort of mid-conversation and look at both uh, Alton and Kairos and say, the hell did you people come from? Well, when a man and a woman love each other, they I get don't, together. No, <laughs> no, I don't mean that. <laughs> oh, well, from the surface, of course. Okay, Captain Obvious, how about we cut the snark? Why <laughs> are you here? You met one of our same? friends. You met one of, our, one of our friends earlier. Oh. Uh, she suggested that we, you know, work together, or not work together, but rather, um, you we, we leave each other alone and not, not get in each other's way, and you kind of spurn that. Uh, now we're just seeing what's up, and if you need any assistance, because there seem to be some fighting. And they uh, they sort of motion at the giant squid, and they say, "Yeah, there was a little bit of that, but." Uh... I don't know, maybe you'll have more luck than we did. And uh, they sort of point behind them at the same time illuminating uh, the space behind them. And what you see is what uh, Lillian was suspected. You see what is essentially a bank vault door, very thick, uh, made with the sort of spinning wheel on the front, and it is gold in color. And what you're seeing is that there is a blast mark on the door itself, but there's not even a dent in the vault. So, uh, your charge didn't work, huh? No, and, uh, believe me when I say that that was, uh, no paltry explosion. Oh, we've heard. Well, uh, should we head home? Uh, if we can open it? So what I would say is, out of character, do any of you have ancient tech? Uh, um, I've got cyber tech. <laughs> I have ancient tech 3, cyber tech 4. So what I would say is if you roll me, uh, Kairos, if you roll me an intelligence and an ancient tech, please. Okay. One success. Uh, what I would say is with the one success is that usually doors like this, they have some form of manual release, some form of emergency option where you could, without the combination, open it in some way. You would just have to root around and try and find one. I think I could probably have a decent crack at that, partially because I've got um, pretty good dexterity of seven, but I've also got, uh, for one of my keystones, I went with there is no lock that can't be picked, which I think would be a relevant keystone here. Yes, and that's a uh, excellent time to address keystones. So the way keystones work is they're essentially a line about a character, uh, something that defines them or something that they hold true. 
And there's two ways to use it that are very important. The first is that if you are able to apply your keystone to a roll, then you can start with two free successes that add to whatever successes you roll uh, that follow. Or you can use it after the roll has been made to reroll as many dice as you wish. The catch is you have to keep the reroll dice even if they're worse. So if you want to use a keystone, uh, something I neglected to mention is that a keystone is once per session. So using a keystone here, uh, there's probably, this is a big door that needs its lock picked. I would say that this could be a, we'll call it a dexterity and a sleight of hand. Oh, perfect. I've got a four in sleight of hand. Um, okay, so Lillian will have been listening to all of this and because it's I'm assuming it was all verbal, right? This uh, mm -hmm. conversation between them. Uh, she would have been able to hear quite well what was going on. Um, so, like, at the mention of the lock needing to be picked, she swims around and, like, holds up hand and goes, Hi, hi! This seems like exactly my time oh, it's, to Oh, it's the freaking lighthouse again. <laughs> hi, yeah! And so she sort of... Um, she asks, um, "Is it was it Atlan who was it Atlan or Kairos who had the uh, who figured it out? Who had the uh, ancient Kairos? Okay. okay. Um, so she gets uh, the information from Kairos as to uh, what sort of thing she's looking for. So she's got a decent idea, uh, and then she's going to have a go at it and." Before we do that, should we should we settle on terms? And then one of the mer sharks sort of crosses their arms in front of them and says, "What do you have in mind?" Well, you did the finding, but we're doing the heavy lifting because without us, you'd have to go back up, spend more resources on more supplies, and coming back down. While we're already here, so. 70-30. Oh, 60-40. We're 60 or 40, correct? You would get the 60. 65-35. Yeah, and I'll say because your friend's injured, I'll carry him back up. That's the extra five. Roll me, Kairos, roll me a uh, charisma and either a leadership or persuasion. Oof, one in each. <laughs> All right, then you're just rolling underneath your charisma. That's a three. Nice. <laughs> Why am I talking? I look I, creepy. I, 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 I. <laughs> Why are you talking? <laughs> oh, good news, it's not a 12. Uh, so they just sort of look at one another. You can tell that they're having that sort of telepathic communication with one another. And then the same Mershark that's been talking says, nah, I think we're going to stick with 60-40. Okay. What's the worst that can happen if I try to, um, I guess heal, well, heal, heal, heal their friend. So <laughs> if you roll a complication, you're going to make it worse. So there is that risk. So if you get a messy critical or you fail completely with 12s, it's going to be worse. Uh, but there, you you could attempt to heal their friend. It is possible. What would the healing be in under? Like what attribute? I would say it would be a intelligence and a first aid or an intelligence and a cyber tech. Oh. What's the difficulty? The difficulty would just be a two. So I have intelligence for and cyber tech for. Okay, and I could probably assist because I've got a cyber tech of three. I got cyber tech too. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm probably the best to assist that then. But you're but you only have a one in first aid, right? Uh, I could... As in, as if I assisted in cyber tech, I could get a three or less. Well, I'm just wondering who has the higher intelligence because I have a four. 
Uh, the inte- the amount of intelligence doesn't really matter for assisting, does it? Because it's one dice regardless. Yeah, it's just one die for the assist. Assisting just matters who has the better points in that skill to have the best chance of succeeding. Oh, I'm just trying to find out who's going to do the primary role. Oh, uh, would it be you with the four and four? Didn't you say? Yeah, I just don't know what Sparta, Sparty had. Uh, oh, my intelligence is two. So I'd be rolling two dice, needing three or less. I have a three Five and two. Primary. Okay. All right. So then, yeah, I guess I'll do the main roll. Alrighty. Yeah. Uh, so I do not manage to assist, but at least I don't get a twelve. Let's see if I split this man in half with my pencil claws. <laughs> if I get a crit. Wow. Oh, hey. man, he's lucky. <laughs> he's oh, lucky. Less. There we go. There's the rolls we've been looking for all night. So. <laughs> Uh, Kairos, you go up to the injured gentleman, uh, and you probably from somewhere on your supply bag or supply belt, however you want to flavor it, uh, you pull out what is essentially a spray foam meant for underwater use. And this foam is such that when you spray it over a wound on a cyborg frame, it knits it back together. And I don't want to say it's nanotechnology, but it kind of reassembles whatever you spray foamed. Um, It's not like a permanent fix, but it's enough that any pain or any discomfort or any functionality, uh, the functionality is restored, the pain is lessened, etc., etc. So using your knowledge and your skill, you spray the injury with the foam. And uh, the gentleman sort of, you know, kind of rolls his shoulder a little bit and says, Hey, that's that's not half bad. Hey, uh, Bobby, Bobby, um, let's give him the 65. And uh, Bobby, as you now know him, says, all right, fine, 65. Excellent. Good job, Kairos. <laughs> the gym is much nicer than what, and saying what happened to him, because I, I had an idea of doing the major pain of like, let me see your hand, break a finger, heal him up. <laughs> like, there you go. <laughs> now the shoulder doesn't hurt. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> That's probably what would have happened on um, I was, a complication. I, I was half expecting Kairos to pretend to be rolling um, intelligence and cyber and actually roll strength and fisticuffs and just cut him in half and go... It, it crossed my mind. One, one less person to deal with. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you do have a vault door to open. Okay, I'm on it. Um, so it was two free successes for using my keystone right correct then that is what i'll do i'll use there's no lock that can't be uh that can't be picked for two free successes and then seven on a skill of four that's five successes five successes now this is important because this is how you get drive other than the gm being nice um because it was a difficulty of three um, what means is that you have five successes. You can shift two of those successes. So you would still have three successes needed for the task. You can shift two of those successes into one point of drive. So you would now have two drive. Yes. Okay. So good news. Uh, based on what, uh, Kairos has told you, uh, Lillian, you are able to find the manual release. Uh, you have to dig a little bit into the wall, the neighboring wall, and uh, more or less reach around in the darkness, but eventually you find a lever, lever, you pull it, and the door opens. And what you see on the inside is not what you were expecting. You know, maybe you were expecting to see some form of a uh, uh, an interior bank vault, but what you see is, like an airlock, another sort of antechamber, and then another door similar to this one. But you're God. also seeing Damn it. you also are seeing two very important things. The first is that there is a console with illuminated lights, so it's still powered, that is currently in the middle of the space. There's a pedestal with lights and there's some sort of a display. But what probably really catches your attention is the probably dead forms of the cilia team. There's three of them. They are just sort of ambi buoyant just sort of floating twirling mid air or not mid air mid water they're just you know unconscious dead both they're just sort of there 
Well, that's terrifying. Yeah. I'm going to turn them are sharks after you guys. <laughs> and, uh... Oh. If they were inside and a concussion blast went inside there, that would have... Ooh, yeah, that would have shaken up the inside of this something fierce. Yep. I'm just going to look back at them like, you killed them all. And they all look among one another and they go, hey, I wasn't the one that pushed the button. Bobby, you pushed the (laughs) fucking button. Of course it's your fault. Bobby has a moment of crisis. Um... So, should Kairos maybe make a, another cybertech check with me assisting to try and figure out if they're dead? Because if they're at least alive, we could maybe at least try and get their bodies back up to uh, within CNET range, so at least they can be recovered. Mm-hmm. Um. So my arm technically has um, reach, like of a harpoon. Mm-hmm. Could I just reach in and like grab one of the bodies and pull them up? Because I don't trust this chamber. Yeah, you could uh, just reach in and grab one. All right, oh, come here, come here, come here. Okay. And I'm just gonna wiggle her around, like you know, what piece of newspaper, just just to see if she's dead. <laughs> Why don't you do the uh, the cyber tech roll? Okay. And we'll see what happens. Uh, cyber tech intelligence? Yep, you got it. Uh, no help again. Ah. So now this is Ooh. very important because those are two ones, which means you get a critical success. So what you learn is that in studying the one you've grabbed and maybe applying the same philosophy to the other two, they are still alive, barely. But it wasn't the concussion of the blast that did them in like this. It was a very powerful electric charge. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to reach in and grab the other two and look to Bobby. Like, hey, you did this to them. Take them up. <laughs> now. And, and, and Bobby and the Mer Sharks look at one another and they go, uh, tell you what, just keep the whole thing, man. We'll cut our losses. Here. We'll we'll take these guys back up. Excellent. And uh, the Mer Sharks very awkwardly sort of swim closer, grab the Cilia team, and begin swimming towards the surface. Which leaves Go. all of you, supposedly, between the... <laughs> uh, there's Good a job. door. Yeah, there's a door between you and your prize, hopefully. And something uh, with electricity running through it underwater, which I do not want to go anywhere near. <laughs> How big's the uh, body of the squid? The giant squid is about the size <laughs> of a whale, like a blue whale. So it's <laughs> fairly sizable. So we can't like use it to prod the console. I mean, you could. It would just be very awkward. <laughs> Can we use it to try to short out the... The, I guess, charge or whatever. Well, you tell me what you're doing with the limb and I will describe appropriately. I, I guess uh, I'm going to cut off a manageable part mm-hmm. of the squid, maybe a big tentacle or whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to throw it against the, the door and see what happens, or the console and see what happens. Okay. So this is going to be a dexterity and a ranged weapon roll. Three successes, more than sufficient. So you throw the tentacle, and the tentacle sort of tumbles through the water. Remind me, were you aiming for the console or the door? Uh, probably. Where were the Mersh or the uh, the cilia? Where were they clustered around? Okay, they were clustered around the door. So the door. you throw it towards the door, and it's a good thing you did, because as the tentacle bit impacts the door there is a discharge of electricity, uh, almost like a spit of sparks kind of emits into the water. And uh, the tentacle is turned into calamari. So, hey, you've got a meal. 
Oh, that looks tasty. Well, you did say you like uh... kinks for the week, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we don't want to touch the door. Uh, do you want to try that again with the... Um, uh, do you want to try that again with the console? Make sure that's safe to touch? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll cut off a smaller piece to, uh, as to not damage the console. I won't require a roll for this one. Actually, you know what? Let's do a roll because you could get some drive. Why don't we do a uh, another dexterity ranged weapons, but I'm going to make the difficulty a one. And we're at three drive right now? Uh, well, uh, with three successes, you would now be now at three. Are. Yes. <laughs> so... Uh, when you throw the new bit of tentacle, it impacts the console, and the console lights illuminate a little bit brighter. And then the tentacle just sort of drifts off to the side, and the console remains illuminated. Okay, so at least we now know that the console is safe to touch. Um, so we just need to avoid touching the door, and Lillian's going to swim inside, um, and she's going to use, like, her tentacles to anchor to um like uh something on the wall behind her away from the electrified wall so that she doesn't accidentally drift too far forwards okay uh, basically using one of her tentacles as a lifeline so she can yank herself back quickly if need be and she's going to have a look over the console all right on the console, you see a very simple system in Old English. Well, for the setting, Old English. Uh, what you see are the words airlock controls and an on and an off. It is currently set to off. Hmm. She presses the on button. <laughs> okay. While she does this, what are uh, Alton and what are Kairos doing? Are you remaining outside? Are you joining her inside? Um, they blew up stuff, so there's some debris kicking around, right? A little bit, yeah. I'm trying to find something that's big enough to wedge this door open. Okay. Just keep it from closing. Okay. Let's say you find a big chunk of rebar. Yes, yeah. I'll, I'll keep it, just wedge it into the door frame there so it can't really close. Okay. I'm going to be, I guess, outside waiting for, you know, the all clear signal and be looking around to make sure um, there are any surprises. Do I, do I understand the old English? Yeah, you understand it. Okay. Um, then, yeah, I, I'd, I suggest that at the very least the narrate stays outside because it might get um, a bit dry in here for them soon since me I and can, the me I can and the walk cats. on land I thought Nerid couldn't Nerid can oh okay oh then yeah then never mind it's fine so if I read the situation correctly oh, so you all are going <laughs> inside the compartment uh, yeah okay all right so uh, with all of you inside uh, we'll say that uh, Lillian you push the on on the airlock and immediately the door behind you begins to swing close. Do you block it, Chisno? Uh, are we all in? Yeah, you're all in. Mm. Uh, the door that's closing, what, what's on the inside of that door? Like, is, is there a way to open it? Yeah, there's some form of uh, tumbling uh, wheel sort of apparatus that you could potentially open it from the other side. Okay, then then I'll pull the rebar out when I start seeing it, try and get closer to close. Okay. And it's a good thing, too, because as the door comes to a close, uh, the airlock uh, sign, the pedestal, illuminates to green, and immediately the water level in here begins to drop. And after maybe about two or three minutes, you are now in a pressurized air environment. And uh, as soon as there is no trace of water left, the second door opens up. And inside, you see the interior of a true bank vault. You are seeing uh, safety deposit boxes. You are seeing bars of gold. Uh, but what is really catching your attention is on a pedestal like a, uh, a Roman sort of column sort of pedestal. 
um, there is a painting encased in a plastic bag. And this painting, uh, if any of you are art buffs, are it is the famous painting. Uh, say, what is it? Say, it's this is not a pipe. I can't remember how you say it in French, but this is not a pipe. Um, it is a very old piece of art. Probably what you're looking for. Ce n'est pas un peep. That's how it is. Well, no, is it just a plastic bag? Um, yeah, it looks like it's just been plastic wrapped. Is there anything we can wrap Protect like, it with further? Yeah. I would say, uh, why don't we have you do a... Uh, everybody can roll me a intelligence and a perception. Okay. I was just going to say, we have compartments on our frames. Mm -hmm. Are one of them big enough to hold? Uh, the cancers Maybe. definitely would be. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, so Shizno, uh, Kairos thinks that you could just stash the art in the cancers back compartment and be fine. I didn't get a 12, though. I also got a 1. You need two for it to take effect. Ah, okay. I just kind of scuttle on over and go, like, uh, my back. Okay, so we'll put it inside. Also, the gold. Yep, we'll grab plenty of that. Is there anything else in here that's of interest? Uh, yes. Besides the gold, the art, and the safety deposit boxes, you see that there is... What might be an old-timey server? You know, kind of a, a server rack with uh, server blades inserted into it. It's not active. It doesn't seem to have any running lights, but you could conceivably take it with you. Uh, would that fit with the painting into the cancer's back? You would have to get rid of the gold. You would have to get rid of the gold. Like it's either the gold or the server. Um, I'll take the. We'll, we'll put the server in the cancer frame, and then I can probably carry the gold. Um, lots of ten, because because like the gold, the gold will survive the pressures of the water. The so I can just hold that in my tentacles, um, whereas the server blades won't. So the painting and the server blades are what we should put in the in the cancer frames back uh, because those are the ones that need to be protected from the water. Smart thinking. Yep. And as you will find, uh, most of the quote-unquote valuable items, you do sort of have to decide amongst yourselves as players uh, how are you going to protect the item on the way back up. It is, it's an interesting thing that every group will have a different answer to. But the good news is that after you've grabbed as much gold as you can, you've stashed the art away, you've stashed the painting away, or you've stashed the art and the server away, uh, you cycle back out of the airlock. And sure enough, you step in the airlock, push the airlock on, fills back up with water, step outside. What you see outside is that the giant squid is gone. And in its place are two individuals. Now, these two individuals are in the Ruslaka frame, and the Ruslaka frame is a trencher, someone who lives in the very deep depths of the ocean. Um, but they have all sorts of ornamentation, teeth from animals, uh, fangs, uh, wicked-looking horns, and they're both carrying bolt tubes. And one of them says, See, I told you we'd get another one. All we had to do was wait for them to open up the stupid thing. And the other one says, yeah, 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 you were right. So, uh, you three, uh, why don't you just hand over all your valuables and, uh, you can go about your way. Oh, that's weird. I was just gonna say the same thing to you guys. <laughs> so, what do we have weapons? That is what I was gonna ask next. <laughs> so, what does everybody have weapon-wise? Um, a ton of daggers. Okay. I'd have a, like a combat knife, but then also, is it a bullet gun? Yeah, so let's a explore that a little bit. Uh, let me pull up that section. So, uh, what I would say is you could either have brought down 
a lance jet, which is basically a specialized gun that can fire underwater. Uh, or you could have brought down a bolt tube, which again is sort of a torpedo launcher. Um, the daggers and the lance jet, you would have 1d4 of damage. The bolt tube would have 2d4 of damage. Now, what's more common and more compact? Uh, I would say the lance jet for sure. Like, you could probably, with a little bit of tinkering, fit a lance jet, even on a Nareed frame. You could probably stash it somewhere on your person. Sort of a concealed weapon. Now, because of the the cost of the ammo, would that be something that a hunter would have? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. You would have, uh, you would have enough that uh, a lance jet is technically a tier one item. And as a tier one item, it's sort of ubiquitous, and you can just have it for free. Okay, yeah, then I have a lance jet. Okay. Would I be able to have a bolt tube with piercing? Uh, you can, but as the Cancer, I would remind you that you also have your built-in weapons. Oh, that is right. I do have those. Uh, you know what? I'll just have my claws. So, yeah. before so I it... push us into combat, do you want to try a social situation? They don't seem like the kind to uh, really be persuaded in these matters. Could try and intimidate them. You could. Does anybody <laughs> have intimidation? I have two. I have three. So I can assist. I only have exactly. three charisma. I would say this is going to be actually a body and intimidation because maybe you're impressing them with your size or your stature or how you're holding yourself. So I have a 4-3. I don't know if that's better than yours. Uh, I have an 8-2. 8-2 so uh, and two is probably <laughs> the way to go for the main role and then uh, your one dice needing a 3 for the support. I'd be, I've, I've only got one intimidation, so... I have very low chance of being useful. Um, can I assume that the dive is like momentum? Yes. Uh, okay. There is, if you look on, because I was looking at it myself, uh, it's one of these PDFs. Give me one moment. Uh, it starts on page 13 is the chart of how you can spend your drive. And what I would say is that with the three points you have at the moment, uh, a interesting thing you could do is create an advantage, which would lower the difficulty of this task. But you would have to tell me what this advantage is. Well, as a cancer frame, I like to imagine that it has kind of like the standard diving around mode. Mm -hmm. And then when it goes into combat, it just bulks out. Kind of like, you know, the anime... Um, my hero, you know, all might just gets bigger. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. I, I, I'll give you the advantage. We'll say that instead of it being a difficulty of four, it is now just a three. All right. Um, do either of you have any? Oh. Uh, do you have any keystones that might help with that? Oh yeah. Well, let's take a look here. I have those who dare win. Win at any cost. Never bet in a friend. Uh, to protect those that I am with. Uh, yeah. First one in, last to leave. Uh, and the old ways could lead to a better tomorrow. I think the first one would apply here. Okay, so yeah, I'll pop that then. And let's see what happens. Right, Get a sense. total of four successes, uh, which is one more than you needed. So, interestingly enough, uh, when you bulk out and with... Uh, Altan helping out, sort of being the guy in the back with his lance jet, you know, looking very intimidating. <laughs> uh, with the two of you combined, the uh, the Rislaka pirates sort of look at one another and go, yeah, I, d I don't want to die today, so how about we just pretend I never saw you? Is that cool? We're cool. You're cool. And they finger gun you as they sort of start to swim away and just sort of back <laughs> off. I'll just say back to someone, who are you? Yeah, exactly. I don't know who the hell you are. <laughs> and unless any of you actually shoot at them, they will very quickly sort of disappear into the darkness. Do you uh, want us Lillian, to shoot them? 
No. Entirely <laughs> up to you guys. Lillian starts to, Lillian starts to put away the knives she'd started to pull out of her clothes. I look back to Altan, and I was like, ah, I didn't get a use to doesn't snip. It happens. Uh, maybe it's for the best. Well, we have precious cargo here, and who knows if they'd been damaged if we fought them. That is fair. Mm. Well, shall we ascend? Yes, let's. All right. So normally you. what you're supposed to do is you ascend. You're supposed to take decompression stops. But for the sake of argument, uh, I've sort of hand-waved that for this because you were just in a pressurized environment when you went through the airlock. So I'm sort of sort of waylaying a little bit. And that's something I encourage to other mate GMs is use the pressure rules that would make sense. Don't just force pressure rules onto your players if they're not going to really have a risk involved. So we'll say for sake of argument, you guys get right back on up to the tube-man dwelling uh, where you met Zervos. And Zervos is uh, very pleased to see you. He says, ah, well, you, you've done finally here. Uh, I'll see to it that your accounts are properly accredited, and uh, it's good doing business with you. I also heard you might have saved some, some of them cilia folk. Uh, they asked me to pass along their contact information so that uh, we might work together in the future. I will tell them we're happy to help. Yeah, it was Kairos who did most of the work for saving them. I just flung them around to see if they're still alive. <laughs> And Zeros kind of looks between the two of you like, um, okay. And eventually just shrugs and says, well, this is a successful business transaction. I wish, wish you all adieu. And he takes his art, turns around, heads down the corridor, leaving you three with a lot of money, some extra gold, and a server, which could even be more valuable than the gold. And that is where we're going to end our little one shot here. Cool, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, it was. So the one thing we didn't touch on was combat, but uh, combat is one of those things in Mate where it would have been a three rounds and then done. So if you're familiar with Vampire the Masquerade or World of Darkness, it would have been very quick. It would have been sort of opposed roles uh, to see who's the better melee combatant or who's the better shot. Um, maybe I'll touch on that more in a, in a future uh, sort of preview of the system but i think for what we saw tonight we saw a good breadth of the system even if even if we did have a little bit difficulty with the rolls tonight <laughs> but yeah uh this is where i'm gonna end the recording uh so youtube thank you so much for listening uh hopefully this is to your liking i welcome any and all feedback and hopefully this uh persuades you to check mate out but with that i say goodbye bye stream